You can have two reps run the exact same process, but one will sell and earn 10 times the other rep. Why is that? In this video, I'm gonna show you the psychology of selling, the 10 steps of selling that actually works. Number one, be aware of your enthusiasm level. Imagine if we're at Salesforce's Dreamforce event and I'm like, hey, I'm Marcus Chan, great to meet you. You'd be like, WTF, back up. Now imagine doing that in a sales situation. You'll completely turn your prospects off because they'll feel like you are pushing yourself at them. And anytime you are feeling pushed, you naturally are going to resist. Versus, what if I'm like, hey, I'm Marcus Shen, great to meet you. Same words, very different feeling. This is why it's key to be aware of your enthusiasm level and adjust it accordingly to the situation. This ties into point number two. Don't try to be someone you're not. One of the biggest mistakes you may be making is trying to imitate the personality or attitude of someone else. That may work for them, but it may not work for for you. For example, if you have a chill attitude, don't try to be someone that's high energy as they'll come off fake and insincere. You want to be real, genuine, and authentically you for your entire sales process. And anytime your process don't feel like you are being you, that'll cause trust to go down. Your energy and vibe will feel off and that will negatively affect you. Number three, stop pitching. One of the top reasons that prospects don't buy is because they do not feel heard or that you do not truly understand their needs or concerns. It breaks down the reps coming in ready to pitch on why they have the best solutions versus coming in with the mindset to seek to understand to see if it's even a good fit. When we resist the itch to pitch, then the prospect gets a chance to voice what's on their mind. If we do it right, they'll be sold. They have to make a change even before we present anything. Here's a simple example. One of my reps and I had an appointment with the CEO of a large grocery chain. It was supposed to be a short 15 minute meeting, but based on our discovery and our conversation, it lasted almost an hour. This entire time, we're engaged deeply into his pains, desires, challenges, goals, etc. He suddenly realized close to the top of the hour that he had to take off our doctor's appointment. And even though we had not presented or discussed any of our solutions, he said, gents, this has been a very enlightening meeting. It's clear we have some major process issues. I want to hear about how you can help us. Can we set another meeting later this week? This CEO felt heard and it was clear he needed a solve even before we presented a single thing. And yes, we ended up selling him later that week and my rep made a few thousand dollars commission off that single deal. Number four, stop trying to sell them and see if you can even help them. When you're trying to sell someone, it's all about you, okay? And let's be real here, it's super self-serving. It's about how good your company is, all the features, all the benefits, etc. You're simply focused on you. And what happens when you focus all on you? Your prospects resist, they push back, they give objections. Instead, the goal should be focused on them. It's understanding if you can even help them. This then leads to you asking more questions in your process, diving in deep to see if it's even a good fit. This is why when you look at the call recordings of the top reps, their listen to talk ratio is 70-30, 80-20, or even 90-10. That's 70% listening, 30% talking, or 80% listening, 20% talking, or even 9% listening, 10% talking. Now shoot for 90-10 and you'll be world class as now you are focused on them and see seeing if you can understand if you can even help them. Number five, read your prospect's mind. Top salespeople know their ideal customer profile inside and out as if they can read their prospect's minds. The more you can start to think like your prospect, the more you can understand them and then ultimately then craft conversations they actually care about. And a really good way to think about this is using some of Dan Kennedy's smart market diagnosis profile questions, such as what keeps them up at night, indigestion boiling up to their esophagus, eyes open, staring at the ceiling. What are they afraid of? What are they angry about? Who are they angry at? What are their top three daily frustrations? What trends are occurring will occur in their business and their lives? What do they secretly, ardently desire the most? Is there a built-in bias to the way they make decisions? For example, CFOs usually are highly analytical and numbers-based. Do they have their own language? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, when they feel heard and understood, resistance reduces. Number six, deep clarity leads to value. Have you or someone you love ever been really sick, 
and they had no idea what was causing it. It's painful, but then great doctors take the time to diagnose, take tests, etc., to eventually come to a conclusion on what it is exactly. By simply having clarity on what the problem is and the impact, you automatically feel better because now you can be prescribed a treatment to deal with it. This is the same with our prospects. The difference is that top salespeople diagnose and provide deep clarity through powerful and deep questions which builds trust. But here's the challenge. When our prospect comes to us and says, I've got this problem, most salespeople say, hey, well, you're in the right place. We've got this awesome solution that's going to help you. That provides little to no value. Instead of pitching, ask deeper questions, such as, can you help me understand more about that? You know, why is that important for you? How's that impacting you? How's it impacting your teams, your customers, your business? What's your ideal outcome? How come? How will that impact you? What happens if a year goes by and you're still dealing with this issue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see by using questions as a tool, this provides deep clarity on the issue, the clear opportunity cost of not taking action, the clear cost of an action, and more. Number seven, the current state versus the desired state. Have you ever seen a before and after picture of someone that just went through a major weight loss? Now, why is this such a powerful sales tool? Because it shows a very clear before state and an after state. We can actually apply the same concept in our sales process by uncovering the current state versus the desired after state. Let's say I'm on a sales call with a CRO, a Chief Revenue Officer, to sell a sales training program. Imagine if I can cover the current state first, their average closing ratio, last year's revenue numbers, number of reps, etc. And then the desired state, the closing ratio, the goals, desired outcomes, impact, etc. Now, how powerful and how much trust do I have by being able to state a very clear current versus desired state statement? For example, so Lisa, if I understand right, the team of five finished last year $5 million with a closing ratio of 20%. And what you'd like to do is hit $10 million this year, double the closing ratio to 40%, which help every rep max their comp plan, will help you make a million dollars plus in earnings with $200,000 in stock on top of that while hitting a presence club, which will ultimately save Set you up with the extra cash to invest into adding more to your real estate portfolio to build your wealth. And you want to do this by ensuring every rep is set to win with the right training, skills, and resources. Is that right? Now, as you can see, this ties back into the prospect feeling very heard and understood. It's all about them and not about you. It's about uncovering their current state and their future disaster. State. It's a very clear gap in between. Number eight, stop dancing around the question and just ask. Here's the reality. You probably are a genuinely good person that cares and is helpful. Prospects probably like you. This also means that some prospects will be afraid to tell you bad news or to be transparent with you. Now, as long as you keep the triple T in mind, your tact, tone, and timing, oftentimes just directly asking things can help you gain trust and credibility even more. Let's say, for example, you sell a sales enablement tool and even me with the head of sales. They've been super engaged, but they're not giving you a hard yes or a hard no. They're telling you they're a 10 out of 10, but it seems like they're still on the fence. So here's an example. Hey, Lisa, so you've told me you're a 10 out of 10, yet it seems you're hesitant to proceed forward. So what's on your mind? That's it. Don't be afraid to have those direct conversations. Now they may be like, well, I have objection X, which is great because now you can deal with that. Or they might be like, uh, I guess you're right. Let's make it happen. Both are very desirable outcomes. Number nine, be conversational. Psychology shows us that when people are actually speaking, that's when they're most engaged. Even though much of what I covered so far is folks are asking deep questions, it shouldn't feel like an interrogation because it's a conversation in which it should be going back and forth. And this applies even if you're doing a demo or presentation. Just imagine during the demo presentation, every 60 seconds or so, it's simply pausing and asking questions like, what are your thoughts? Can you see how this is better than what you're currently doing? How do you see yourself applying X feature? How will that impact person X, et cetera? These types of micro closes or mini trial closes helps keeps them engaged throughout the whole process. Also, if they're agreeing with you, they become micro commitments and this makes a close at the end very logical and very easy. Number 10, always play three to five steps ahead. Now, if you ever played chess with a rock star player, it seems like for every move you play, they are playing multiple moves ahead. This ultimately builds respect very quickly because clearly 
clearly they know what is up. Now, this is a very powerful psychological play you can also implement in your process as well as it builds trust very quickly. For instance, write down the most common objections you get in your entire sales process, and then write down what you can do in advance to eliminate those objections. Let's just say, for example, you know that when you work with CFOs, chief financial officers, they always want to see the direct hard and soft costs in the form of some sort of ROI, return investment, or a COI, cost of an action calculator. Now, instead of waiting until the very end to show that to justify your price, you simply go over earlier in the process to eliminate that objection. And you can apply this to literally anything. So for example, if you find they're often unsure about their use case, provide case studies or share stories in advance of the exact same use case. Unsure about stability company being here long term? Involve a founder as part of the sales process. You get my point. The key is doing it before or it's an objection. And when you play three to five moves ahead, it helps build a ton of psychological trust and it's clear it's not your first rodeo. So there it is, psychology of selling, the 10 steps of selling that actually work. I wanna hear from you, which one of the ideas did you find the most useful? And if you wanna learn exactly how to overcome any sales objection in the recession, I'll see you in this next video here.